Pyeongchanghua. Peace here and now. Let me welcome all of you to the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. My name is Jennifer Clyde. I'll be serving as the MC of the opening ceremony. Celebrating the fourth year of this year, the Pyeongchang Peace Forum has quickly become a global peace platform thanks to all of your support. This year, under the main theme of the Declaration to End the Korean War and Beyond, we will cover the five agenda topics including economy, sports, DMZ peace zone, UN SDGs, and peace public policy. We will also cover the special topic, which is to promote cooperation for peace through the two Koreas co-hosting the 2024 Gangwon Winter Youth Olympic Games. This year again, we have 17 partner sessions organized by various organizations to discuss various issues concerning peace on the Korean Peninsula, East Asia, and the world. We have many participants, both online and offline. Let me first introduce the special distinguished guests who are here with us today. Please welcome them when I announce their names. First of all, Mr. Park byung Sok, Speaker of the National Assembly. Thank you very much. Mr. Jim Rogers, co-chair of the 2022 Pyeongchang Peace Forum. Welcome. Ms. Kang Gum Shil, a co-chairperson of the Peace Pyeongchang Peace Forum. Mr. Son Hyuk Sang, co-chair. Thank you very much. Yang Gi De, member of the National Assembly. Kim Chang, Kim Chang Jun, Chairman of the Korea American Institute. Thank you very much. Next, Kwak Do Young, Chairman of the Gangwon Provincial Council. Han Wang Gi, Han Wang Gi, Mayor of Pyeongchang. Thank you very much. Last but not least, Governor Choi Moon Soon of Gangwon Province. Thank you very much for your presence. I wish to be able to introduce every one of the participants, but here at this venue, we have many moderators, speakers, and distinguished participants. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to invite the opening speech to celebrate the opening of the 2022 Pyeongchang Peace Forum, which will be delivered by the co-chair of the forum, as well as the representative of Peace for Earth that is discussing complex global issues, and also chairperson of Kangwon Art and Culture Foundation, Ms. Kang Gum Shil. Please welcome her with a big round of applause. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. This is the fourth forum of its kind ever since the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. I have come from Seoul this morning. I predicted that it would be cold in Pyeongchang, but it is even colder than I expected. Thank you very much for joining us in person despite the cold weather, and welcome. This is the third time that I am participating at the Pyeongchang Peace Forum, and all three times we are hosting the forum under the pandemic. Many events were canceled or postponed because of the pandemic, but the Pyeongchang Peace Forum, hosted here in Gangwon, has been hosted each and every year. I do believe that this shows how strong the determination of Gangwon province is for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And I would like to mention this once again. In hosting the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in 2018, 
the person who has contributed to the most to winning the bid for that Olympic, as well as hosting this Pyeongchang Peace Forum, I would like to thank Governor Choi Moon Sun for all of his contributions. Thank you very much. We also have the Pyeongchang Peace Center, and we believe that Pyeongchang is a symbol of global peace, and this is represented by Pyeongchang and the mayor of Pyeongchang, as well as Koika and the Pyeongchang 2018 Legacy Foundation. Thank you very much to the staff of all four organizations for your efforts. Thank you also to His Excellency Speaker Park byung suk of the National Assembly, as well as Minister Yi In Young of the Ministry of Unification, who has shared his opening remarks with, who will be sharing his opening remarks with us via video. Thank you to all of the co-presidents. Minister Yi In Young was to join us in person, but I have. I'm sure that you have seen in the news that this morning Russia invaded Ukraine and in this 21st century we continue to see the struggles between powers and that is something that we are witnessing on this very day that we are hosting this peace forum dreaming of peace we hope to achieve peace not using any violent ways. We are against all violent forms of action. I do hope that Pyeongchang Peace Forum today will deliver the message of peace to over 200 participants from around the world who are participating as speakers, as well as the audience who have joined us both online and offline. We are gathered here on the Korean Peninsula where we are still a divided nation. We are gathered here to dream of peace and to envision peace together. I would also like to add that in 2024, we hope to be the host for the Kangwon 2024 Youth Olympic. We will be gathering the youth from around the world, and we hope that the youth can live in a future of peace on the Korean Peninsula. Let us gather our wisdom and determination to move forward for that peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was the opening speech delivered by co-president Kang Gum Shil. And with that, we have opened the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. I sincerely hope that this forum will guide us into peace. The Pyeongchang Peace Forum is a global peace platform that has been created and nurtured by many stakeholders and many experts, including uh, co-president Kang gum -shil. We have a total of six co-presidents and members of the organizing committee representing various areas. And on behalf of them, we have three co-presidents that will deliver the welcoming remarks. First of all, I'd like to invite President of Koika, Son Hyuk Sang, who is dedicated to global development cooperation for a more inclusive future. Please welcome President Son with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Son Hyuk Sang. I am the president of Koika. I would like to sincerely welcome Mr. Park Byung Sok, Speaker of the National Assembly, Governor Choi Moon Soon of Gangwon Province, as well as co presidents Kang Gum Shil and Jim Rogers, and many other distinguished participants and online audience to the 2022 Pyeongchang Peace Forum. I would also like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the Gangwon Province and Pyeongchang County, as well as 2018 Pyeongchang Legacy Foundation for organizing this forum despite many challenges. 
It was four years ago when we hosted the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games, also known as the Peace Olympic Games, and since then, many have changed. When we look back on the past four years, we have had many ups and downs along the Korean Peninsula peace process, but I believe that we have made significant achievements. Most of all, I remember that we were able to end the phase of crisis on the Korean Peninsula and started to discuss peaceful coexistence. As we all remember, the discussion of peaceful coexistence will not be maintained by itself. We need to make continuous efforts to maintain the momentum of our discussion. In this regard, I believe that the model of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022 is very timely as it is claiming peace here and now. Peace is not just an abstract discussion, but this is very much relevant to our reality. And we're discussing peace on this peninsula, and we are reminded of the importance of peace once again. But as you can see in today's breaking news of the Ukrainian situation, we know that peace is not something that we need to achieve not only on the Korean Peninsula, but many parts of the world. The pandemic has been going on for more than two years. And the pandemic has amplified many global challenges, including climate crisis, income disparity, inequalities, and gender discrimination. And the pandemic has further worsened conflicts and tension among generations, races, regions, and many parts of the society. We need to make further efforts to secure peace and avoid risks of conflict. For the past two years, the humanity was able to co-develop vaccines and distribute vaccines to developing countries through COVAX. But we, at the same time, saw many signs of nationalism and protectionism. And many parts of the world, they have been blaming other countries for their domestic issues caused by the pandemic. Peace is not easy to achieve, but in order to maintain the state of peace, we need to work really hard. Otherwise, peace may slip through our fingers instantly, and the pandemic has taught us this very important lesson. I am representing here COICA, and COICA is dedicated to implementing the SDGs, which have been agreed by the international community. And one of the core values and principles of the SDGs is peace. And that is why the UN SDGs is part of the main agenda for the Pyeongchang Peace Forum. Of the 17 SDGs, peace is included in SDG goal number 16. It argues for peace, justice, and strong institutions. It shows that peace is a means to implement the SDGs, but it is an objective and a goal that we need to achieve at the same time. We cannot develop without peace, and we cannot achieve peace without development. It means that development without peace will not be sustainable. If hunger, famine, discrimination, and isolation are not addressed, peace will be threatened and we will see increasing conflicts. And discussing peace on the global stage as is important as discussing peace on the Korean Peninsula. I would also like to ask for your support in implementing the SDGs and promoting international cooperation for development in order to achieve peace. COICA will continue to work with various domestic and global partners to eliminate threats to peace and continue to promote international cooperation for development. Let me now close my welcoming remarks. The global challenges, including the climate crisis and the pandemic, are very complicated and multidimensional. And they are all interrelated. Therefore, we need to find more integrative and creative solutions to addressing these global challenges. These challenges cannot be addressed or resolved by any single country or an institution. We need partnership and cooperation of various organizations and institutions. 
Therefore, we need to strengthen our level of cooperation to achieve peace. We will have this 2022 Pyeongchang Peace Forum for three days starting from today. There are various sessions prepared for you where you will be able to find experts, activists, and members of the central and local governments and international organizations to put their heads together and find solutions to the global challenges. And I'd like to ask for your active participation and share your wisdom and experience. I would like to welcome not only the offline participants, but online participants who are joining us from around the world. And I hope that we can find an integrative and creative solution to peace. I also hope that peace on the Korean Peninsula will contribute to global peace, and discussion on global peace will contribute to building peace on the Korean Peninsula, which will indeed create a virtual cycle. Once again, I'd like to thank all the organizers for putting together this forum, and I hope that this forum will continue to grow into the future when we will have next and the next Winter Olympic Games. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Son Yuk sang for your remarks. Next, we would like to invite an IOC member as well as the coordinating member for the 2024 Gangwon Youth Olympics, who is also a co-president for this conference. He has sent us his remarks right after the Beijing Olympics. Dear friends and colleagues, greetings to you all. My name is Zhang Hong, a member of IOC and co-chair of Pyeongchang Peace Forum Organizing Committee. I express a warm welcome and many thanks to all the participants, hosts, and organizers for their efforts. Four years have passed since Pyeongchang 2018 successful and peaceful conclusion. The legacy of peace and the Pyeongchang spirit is continuing through this forum. And it is with great pleasure and honor for me to be part of this. Governor Shen Min Sun, Mayor Han Wang Ji, my dearest friend Liu Cheng Min, and another five co-chairs, please accept my deepest gratitude for taking the time for this forum. Despite the difficulties posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Olympic Winter Games Beijing 2022 is trying to pursue the ultimate goals of the Games. Just like Pingzhang 2018 proved how the power of sport and the passion of athletes can unite the world as one and build a better world through sport. Building on experiences of Beijing 2022, I will do my very best to help prepare for the upcoming Guangwang 2024 Winter Youth Army Games as the chair of the Coordination Commission. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for supporting us in our journey towards peace. I sincerely look forward to the day when the pandemic is over and we get together in person in Pingchang, Guangwang soon. Peace here and now. Thank you so much. Thank you for your welcome. We have just heard from co-president Chang Hong. We would now like to hear from the U.S. chair of the World Inter Kangwon, as well as the advisor to the Geneva Leadership Public Policy Research Institute. We have co-president Arthur Lindsley. Let us listen to his remarks. Hello, this is Art Lindsley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's an honor to be co-chair of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum again this year. Peace is never something we can take for granted. In 2021 alone, there have been 40 ongoing wars. We can't passively hope that peace will emerge. We need to be fighters for peace. We need to be peacemakers. This means making ourselves vulnerable. If you place yourself in the middle of a conflict, you will likely be misunderstood uh, by people on both sides. We hope through a vigorous exchange of ideas to see breakthroughs of insight and cooperation. There's hope for resolution of many of these conflicts, 
even though the solution sometimes seems impossible. The answer may be closer than you think. It never seemed possible that the wall would come down between East and West Germany, but it did come down. Starting on, on November 9th, 1989, and before long, it was gone. The same thing could happen in many places, including North Korea. All it would take is courageous leaders like Gorbachev or leaders in East Berlin to change their policy. We can't give up hope that change can happen and peace be achieved. In September 2019, I was present at a meeting at the DMZ where an MOU was signed between Governor Moon Sun Choi and Global Hope Network International. In November 2019, the governor brought a delegation to Washington, D.C., where we had meetings at the White House, the State Department, and later at the Senate where the governor spoke to a significant audience. In 2020, I was asked to be chairman of the Intergangwon Cooperation Committee. We've been working on a number of initiatives to forward peace on the Korean Peninsula. I only wish that I was able to be with you in person as I was in 2019. My hope and prayer for you is that numerous solutions will be put forward that will contribute to the settling of conflicts. David Beasley, the executive director of the UN World Food Program, calls food a weapon of peace. This is because hunger often drives conflict. I hope we can devise strategies to develop weapons of peace that will address other causes of conflict. Thank you for the honor of being part of a, a co-chairman uh, this year. I look forward to listening to other speakers at this significant moment. Thank you for the honor of speaking to you. Thank you for your encouraging words and your warm welcome. We heard from Art Linsley. Thank you very much. Let's move on to hear congratulatory messages for the success of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. First of all, on behalf of the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea, we have with us Mr. Park byung Sok, Speaker of the National Assembly. Uh, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Thank you very much. I would like to express my gratitude to Governor Choi Moon Sun, Mayor Han Hwang Gi, as well as former Minister Kang Gum Shil and President Son Hyuk Sang, and six co presidents of the Poor Forum. Thank you very much for your effort. I would also like to acknowledge Chairman Jim Rogers, and um, he has come to Korea uh, to overcome the temperature difference of 45 degrees. I would also like to mention that there are many distinguished participants National Assemblyman Yang Gi De and Lee Young Ho, former Minister of Gender Equality and Family, as well as um, U.S. Congressman Mr. Kim, and, and uh, we have also Buddhist monk Yeo Hun. Thank you very much. Four years ago, here in Pyeongchang, it was winter as a season, but we opened the spring of the Korean Peninsula. At that time, the world, was re the world was united and there was passion connected. However, now, once again on the Korean Peninsula, we are going through a very cold and severe winter. But we want to revitalize the embers of peace by claiming that there is peace here and now. We need to open a spring of sustainable peace. And we're gathered here to find wisdom to open the new spring. The peninsula is still divided between the north and the south. Therefore, peace is very much an economic issue as well. And I hope that the participants at the forum will guide us into the direction of peace. In order to build peace, we need trust. 
trust between the two Koreas and trust between the U.S. and the DPRK. We need to build trust. Also, we need to revitalize the commitment to peace by the U.S. and China. And to do that, we also need to build the consensus among the people in Korea to realize peace. And we need to take steps. Persistently, we should not stop. We should not take a pause. We should continue to walk the walk. We are going to host the 2024 Gangwon Youth Winter Olympics. And I hope that all of us will work together to utilize this Olympics as an opportunity to build peace, sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks. Next, we would like to invite Minister Yi In Young of the Ministry of Unification, who has worked on peace and reconciliation for a very long time. Pleased to meet you. I am Yi In Young, Minister of Unification of the Republic of Korea. Congratulations on the successful hosting of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. It is indeed a great pleasure to meet you on this beautiful winter Pyeongchang Day amidst the determination and passion for peace. Thank you to Governor Choi Moon Soon and Mayor Han Wang Sang, as well as President Son Yok Sang, for this event. And thank you to Chairman Kang Gum Shil of the Gangwon Art and Culture Foundation, as well as Ms. Chang Hung, co president of this forum, and Mr. Arthur Lindsley, a co president, as well as Speaker of the National Assembly, for joining us today and also for your determination and passion for peace. I would like to extend a special thank you to Chairman Jim Rogers for joining us as the keynote speaker. It is indeed a great pleasure to meet you again. We look forward to your insightful presentation on the dynamic future of the Republic of Korea ushered in through the peace on the Korean Peninsula. Throughout the next three days, we have with us members of the academia, the government, and civic groups who are to discuss peace and reconciliation. Thank you very much, and welcome to this forum. Distinguished guests from home and abroad, we see that tension in the international political arena is increasing, and the uncertainties on the Korean peninsula is also rising. We believe that we are currently at an inflection point determining the future of the Korean Peninsula. Currently, our future is very difficult to make a breakthrough. However, given this situation, I believe that determination and passion is needed again, which is the spirit of Pyeongchang that we ignited in 2018. The spring of Pyeongchang in 2018 did not happen by coincidence. It was not something that happened naturally. The situation just before the Winter Olympics was very bleak. In 2017, when there was the inauguration of the Moon Jae-in administration, there was enhanced tension on the Korean Peninsula due to the testing of nuclear weapons by North Korea, as well as the launch of ballistic missiles. Amidst this situation, President Moon has been able to realize a peaceful Olympics here in Pyeongchang, and he announced the Berlin Agenda. He urged that North Korea comes to the table of dialogue and cooperation, and he also made sure that North Korea realizes our principle of not trying to topple the North Korean regime nor achieve unification through absorption. And through much difficulty, North Korea participated in the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, coming back to the table for dialogue, and we were able to start a new journey for peace. Distinguished guests from home and abroad, the spirit of Pyeongchang is the patience striving for peace. It is the wisdom for proactive peace. It is the courage to advocate for peace at all times. The lesson of Pyeongchang is quite clear. What decides the future of the Korean Peninsula is not the situation surrounding the Korean Peninsula, but it is up to us who are the 
stakeholders of peace on the Korean Peninsula. With this memory lingering within us from Pyeongchang, it is indeed a great pleasure to be able to join this forum to talk about peace. At this forum, I hope that we are able to discuss agendas for a creative cooperation for our future. As Chairman Jim Rogers has always reiterated, the Korean Peninsula will indeed become the most interesting place on Earth when we picture our future based on peace from the Korean Peninsula. We also need to make sure that we stand between the two Koreas so that we can cooperate for transnational agendas including food, health, environment, energy and economy. I hope that we could have sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula by sharing a vision amongst us. And that is why it is great to see that the National Contract for Peace and Unification has been included as one of the sessions for this forum. The National Contracts for Peace and Unification is an agreement achieved through social dialogue amidst many people on the Korean Peninsula with various perspectives, regardless of political affiliation beyond administration. We can achieve peace. Regardless of generation, we can achieve peace together. This contract holds the passion for peace amongst the public of the, Kore of the two Koreas. Although we were not able to cross the river of peace, we look forward to proceeding with peace throughout future administrations. Based on the consensus of the people of Korea and the international society, this government will do its best to keep up with our responsibilities until the very end. Distinguished guests from home and abroad, however age-old land may be, if you plant a new seed, you can see that new flowers will blossom and new fruits will come from that flower. The Korean Peninsula has been divided for a very long time, but if we continue to plant the seed of coexistence, we will indeed see the blossom of peace and the fruit of prosperity that we had never experienced before. On this way towards our dream, I hope that the two Koreas will work together with the international society. I also hope that this year's Peace Forum will become a starting point for the message of peace and unification. I do believe that the spirit of Pyeongchang is a spirit asking for North Korea to come back to the table for dialogue and cooperation. We hope to create a miracle together between the two Koreas. Thank you very much for supporting peace on the Korean Peninsula. I thank you and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Minister Lee In-young of the Minister of Unification, thank you very much. Next, I'd like to invite a special congratulatory message from someone very special, uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has been providing us with support for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Please take a look. It is a pleasure to send my warmest greetings to the Pyeongchang Peace Forum. We are living in a time of escalating geopolitical tensions and divisions, when misunderstanding or miscalculation could have disastrous consequences for humanity. It will take unity and solidarity to turn the tide and realize the Pyeongchang Peace Forum vision of peace here and now. Inclusive and participatory dialogue for peace is imperative. Your discussions are also fundamental to advancing the proposals I have put forward in my own report, Our Common Agenda. This is an agenda of action driven by a vision of global cooperation through inclusive, networked and effective multilateralism. The active engagement of civil society, young people and many others will help drive crucial transformations, including the development of a new agenda for peace, which focuses on reducing risks, investing in preventing and peace building, and ensuring women and girls are at the center of peace and security policy. I welcome the Republic of Korea's strong support for multilateralism and cooperation. And I welcome your efforts at this forum to foster cooperation in a wide range of areas, including sustainable development, sports and public diplomacy. The latest developments in the region have reminded us of the need for peaceful diplomatic solutions. We are all inspired by the powerful image of the two Koreas marching together at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. As the world is closing another Olympic chapter, let Pyeongchang remain a symbol of renewed dialogue and friendship. 
The United Nations applauds your initiatives to bring people together in support of lasting peace on the peninsula. I wish you a successful forum in line with the Pyeongchang peace spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Antonio Guterres. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN. Thank you very much for all those who have delivered their remarks. We will now go on to the performance for the successful hosting of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. We would like to invite the following distinguished guests up to the stage. His Excellency Park byung -sok, Speaker of the National Assembly. Jim Rogers. Chairman Jim Rogers, Chairman of Rogers Holdings. Chairperson Kam Gum Shil from the Kangwon Art and Culture Foundation. President Son Hyuk Sang of Koika. Han Wang Mayor Han Wang Gi of Pyeongchang. And last but not least, Governor Che Mun Sun of Kangwon Province. Please join us on stage. Thank you very much for joining us on stage. We will have the opening performance. This is a performance to wish for the successful hosting of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. We would now like to ask the distinguished guests on stage to, you, to untie the scarves on stage. So on the way to peace, there are many nods that we need to untie, and so we will untie the scarves together. One, two, three. Please untie the scarves. Thank you very much. We will now take a commemorative photo. Please stand on stage. We would like to ask you to please stand on stage as we take a commemorative photo. And please face forward. We will now take a picture. Please stand on stage on, at the designated spot. Welcome to the stage. Are we all ready? We would like to ask you to please face forward. Thank you very much. Please return to your seats. Thank you very much. We are currently hosting the 2022 Pyeongchang Peace Forum here at Alpensia Convention Center. In 2008, we had acute confrontations between the two Koreas and also with the U.S., but there was a performance that was the hope of peace. That is the 2008 New York Philharmonic Pyongyang performance. We have with us a New York Philharmonic string quartet who visited Pyongyang at that time with assistant concert master Michelle Kim. We will now invite the string quartet.
The first piece was an encore during the performance in Pyongyang. It is Arirang in the variation for string quartet from a Fantasia version by composer Choi Song Hwan. Let us invite the New York Philharmonic String Quartet. Ladies and gentlemen, the New York Philharmonic String Quartet.
네, 정말 격조. It was indeed a beautiful performance. 방금 멋진 무대 보여주신 뉴욕 피라모. We have with us Cynthia Phelps and Carter Bray, members of the New York Philharmonic String Quartet. They were the members of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra in 2008, and they went to Pyongyang to perform in front of the North Korean audience. Back in 2008, there was a lot of tension on the Korean peninsula, so it was not easy to imagine that such a concert could be held. But they performed various pieces, including the national anthem of the U.S., the American in Paris, and Dvorak Symphony No. 9 from the New World. These were known as very American pieces. And then the North Korean audience applauded for their performance. It was indeed an inspiring moment. And the Pyongyang performance in 2008 was broadcast in PBS and ABC in the U.S. And it was recognized as providing a turning point in improving the relations between the U.S. and the DPRK. So now we would like to invite them to hear from them directly as they were in Pyongyang. I'd like to invite some of the members of the orchestra to learn more about what had happened in Pyongyang back in 2008. Let me invite Frank Huang, Chien Chien Li, Cynthia Phelps, and Carter Bray, members of the New York Philharmonic String Quartet members, as well as Michelle Kim, assistant concert master, and Governor Chen Bun Sun, who visited Pyongyang back then in 2008 as a leader of the NBC broadcasting team. I believe that the stage is being prepared. I'd like to invite these six people up on the stage. Come up on the stage. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. First of all, I would like to welcome you to Pyeongchang. Thank you so much for being with us today uh, for this very grand event. And I would like to thank you on behalf of everyone here and everyone joining us on and offline uh, for the beautiful music. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, we would love to hear stories about uh, your performance when you visited uh, in uh, Pyeongchang, uh, not Pyeongchang, Pyongyang in 2008. And I'd like to begin by asking Frank Huang. Um, we were so thrilled uh, to hear that we would be uh, yeah, given the opportunity to listen to the string quartet version of Arirang right here in Pyeongchang at the uh, Peace Forum, especially because Arirang was the song that the New York Philharmonic Orchestra played back in 2008 in Pyongyang. It's very tricky. <laughs> so could you kindly introduce the New York Philharmonic Quartet as well as the music pieces that you performed for us today? Yes, uh, so my name is Frank Huang. I am the concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic. Uh, and my quartet colleagues, uh, Chen Chen Li, Cynthia Phelps, and Carter Bray, um, and Michelle also is a colleague, but not in the quartet. <laughs> and we are very happy to be here and to be a part of this, this great forum. Uh, today we, we played, we had the, the, the joy of playing Arirang for, for you. And uh, this piece, I, I know there are many versions of this piece, uh, but for me, uh, it's, it's always special to, to play something like this because the idea that the piece represents um, uh, being, being sad that you cannot be with a loved one, being separated, and then the joy of being reunited with, with someone that you love. 
Um, it, it's something that all of us have experienced, uh, no matter where you're from, uh, what country you live in, and whether it's because of different circumstances like South Korea and North Korea, or even recently because of the pandemic, a lot of people could not be with their loved ones. Um, so, so for me, this kind of music, the, the way that it um, can transform uh, different barriers and everybody can understand these emotions uh, makes it very special for us. Um, the, and the second piece we played, uh, the Quartet Satz by Franz Schubert. Uh, this was a quartet movement written by Schubert in 1820 uh, when he was only in his early 20s and he was already developing his late style. Um, and for us, it's a meaningful piece. It's one of the first pieces we played as a string quartet when we formed. And uh, it has, even though it has this stormy and dark opening and ending, there's so much joy and hope in the middle. And to capture all these characters in such a short piece uh, makes it really quite special. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, sure, music is so powerful, as, as you've mentioned, and it sure, I believe, uh, unites people. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my next question is for Chen Chen Li. Um, I heard that it was especially difficult for you to travel to Korea. Uh, did you all have to go through self-quarantining? Yes. Y yes, uh, we all had to quarantine in the hotel for seven days. Seven so, days. So uh, we were isolated, mm -hmm. but the nice thing is that we, our room were all next to each other and we had each other, we can hear each other practicing, knowing that we are next to each other help us get through the seven days. It actually flew by really quickly. Um, every day around meal delivery time, I can hear my colleagues open the door, their door and get the meal. So <laughs> we all had this collective like, um, way of dealing with this. And every day we, had, we scheduled this Zoom call we call them sunset, happy hour. Just we, we, uh, we meet on Zoom, we get a drink, and we talk about how our day was, and we watch a sunset. Um, so we, when we came out of the quarantine, uh, when we were having our first rehearsal, we were just remembering how happy, and so happy to be playing together. And uh, we were just constantly laughing and saying, this music is so beautiful, we were just so happy. And we're very happy to be here, uh, finally um, out of quarantine to play for Korean um, audiences. I'm very happy to be here in this peace forum. I'm very, on very honored. Yes, it must yeah. have been very difficult because of course to perform you do have to rehearse, not just once but so many times, but having been isolated from everyone, just having to be stuck in your own rooms, yeah. not being able to see each other, although you were in the same hotel. Yeah. So you actually uh, just, uh, I guess, uh, rehearsed through Zoom? No, or, we couldn't, oh. but on Zoom, sometimes we talked about the Boeings, uh. and when we came out of rehearsal yesterday, we rehearsed for six hours before our first concert, uh -huh. and <laughs> that was really fun also. Uh -huh. yeah. So although you had to go through all the difficulties and, you know, uh, self-quarantining, uh, you're here in Pyeongchang. So how does it feel to finally be here? Uh, did you have a chance to look around the area or what does Pyeongchang feel like to you? Um, it's very beautiful. We haven't had a chance to explore much yet, but from our window, um, uh, we have this beautiful view of a lake and then the mountain and we see this big ski thing, ski mm -hmm. shoot thing, and uh, we look forward to explore it, the, the area very much. The weather is very cold. Be careful not to catch a cold. <laughs> um, and my next question is for 자, 최문순 도지사님께 질문을 드리겠습니다. Uh, and um, so, Governor Choi, you met uh, some of the members of the New York Philharmonic before, and I'm sure you were filled with memories of 2008. So, how did you enjoy today's performance? First of all, you may wonder why I am sitting on the stage. But at that time, I was the president of the broadcasting station, and we invited the New York Philharmonic, and we went to Pyongyang together. So I was part of that. And when the quartet performed Arirang, it was very special for me because it was specially rearranged for the Pyongyang performance, especially Michelle Kim was crying when she was playing this piece because 
Well, Michelle Kim is also known as Mi Gyeong in Korean name. Her Korean name is Mi Gyeong, and she is a very proud and uh, genius violinist, a Korean descendant. And she was crying when she was performing this piece. And there were all these high-level ranking officials and leaders of the North Korean party in this audience. And it was actually the first time that the U.S. national anthem was played in Pyongyang, and the U.S. national flag was, as was shown in one of the photos, was displayed in the concert hall. So it was a very significant moment. And in the concert hall, there were many people enjoying this concert, and they would all shed tears, and there was a standing ovation at the end of the concert. It was, I think, more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes continuous standing ovation, and these North Korean um, audience, they were there congratulating the performance, and you can see that there was this national flag, and it was a very inspiring moment. Yes, I saw in the this introductory video that I almost was filled with tears myself as well. I wonder how was this concert finally put together in 2008? Was it complicated? Yes, the, the entire process of preparing for this was complicated. In 2006, North Korea conducted the second nuclear testing. Therefore, there was a lot of tension between North Korea and the U.S. And there was a businessman called Pei Gyeonghwan who was doing business in the U.S. And he came up with this idea of inviting the New York Philharmonic and going to Pyongyang. So he contacted us, and we had to go through many different steps. And at that time, the President Bush and State Department and North Korea and the U and South Korea, we had to talk to many different parties to, in order to put this concert together. And at that time, the situation on the Korean Peninsula was very tense because of the nuclear testing. But thanks to our persistent effort, we were able to arrange this concert. And I think it takes a lot of effort and dedication to make this happen. And at that time, the North Korean um, orchestra was scheduled to visit the U.S., and it didn't happen. But we are looking forward to a season two of the performance in Pyongyang. Michelle Kim is now assistant concertmaster, and I hope that she will help us in uh, making that happen. I can feel this excitement uh, from Governor Choi. Thank you very much. My next question uh, is for Ms. Cynthia Phelps and Mr. Carter Bray. It must have been, back then, it must have been a very difficult decision for the members of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra to actually say, yes, we will go to Pyongyang. Uh, was that the case? Well, I mean, we didn't have a personal choice in it. Uh, it was presented to us. We had somebody from the State Department actually come and speak to the entire orchestra, which I found very comforting. I know that many of the South Korean members of the orchestra were quite nervous. And in fact, we all had a lot of apprehension before we went. Um, our previous stop was in Beijing, and we had the Swedish ambassador to um, North Korea come and speak with us about protocols and, and our minders and what we should avoid as far as topics went and how we should conduct ourselves. We knew that we, our phones would be taken away, um, our passports would be taken away, so certainly we were very nervous about the whole thing. I must say, though, when we went, we were treated like royalty. Um, we had beautiful um, meals and banquets and entertainment. And when we actually got on stage to perform, the warmth from the audience, although not immediate, kept growing as the music was being played. And then, as it was mentioned before, by the time we got to Arirang, um, there was just a palpable uh, emotional energy. And indeed, we did not we were not able to leave the stage because the clapping was just so fervent and intense and nonstop. And so really, at the end, we just all waved to each other from the stage to the audience. We waved, and it was just so moving. And many of us were in tears. My Korean friends were making fun of me. They said, you're not even Korean. Why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was just so touched because I have many dear friends. And one of my dearest friends actually lost her brother 
and never saw him again. He was 10 years older and he um, was taken during the war and she never saw him again until 50 years later and she told me this story and I knew that he was in the audience and I wanted to just meet him somehow but I knew I couldn't. So it was a very, very emotional um, experience and in fact we had um, Carter and I uh, got the chance to make some chamber music with some of the musicians. I'll let Carter tell you about that because that was very, very special too. Mm -hmm. So tell us about your experience and how you felt about the whole... Well, yes, Cynthia mentioned that she was a bit apprehensive as uh -huh. many of our colleagues because one is naturally apprehensive about that which you don't know about. Um, but what I understood once we had arrived in North Korea was that our counterparts, our North Korean counterparts, also, obviously, <laughs> were quite apprehensive going into a, a completely unknown situation. Yes. And uh, it was interesting to see in the course of the couple of days that we spent there how they also relaxed towards us. Um, we, uh, Cynthia and I, were lucky enough to participate in what was originally supposed to be a reading session of the Mendelssohn Octet four of us from the New York Philharmonic with four principal players from the Pyongyang Symphony. And uh, initially our contact was very formal, a little bit stilted, stiff. Mm -hmm. uh, we were all shy. We didn't, it was like learning a new language, learning how to interact with each other. But we did have a language in common, which of course was music. Music, yes. And we read through the first movement. Uh, we had been told that was all we were supposed to do but it went very well, and the audience seemed to like it very much, so we looked at each other and we decided to continue playing through to the end of the composition, all uh -huh. four movements. And by the end of the, the performance, uh, the eight of us were smiling at each other, giving each other high fives. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, um, it was quite something. Uh, so I think that was very indicative of the potential for human understanding that one can reach at least through music and uh, a reminder that all of us suffer from the same hopes and fears um, as human beings. We mm -hmm. all share those. So uh, often people, I would imagine, would ask you, so how different or similar was Pyongyang uh, compared to what you would imagine it to be? So in the beginning, Maybe it was a different thing, but then later on it took some time for you to kind of warm up, but definitely it was a very meaningful and very special experience for you, I believe. Extremely special. Yes. Thank you. Um, and also, now this question is for you, uh, Michelle Kim. Uh, in that introductory video that we took a look at, um, you were being interviewed. Um, I so don't know, I don't know, I didn't see it, so I don't oh, know Oh, you didn't see it, okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> So there was, uh, you know, a part of you being interviewed. And I was just wondering um, how it felt to see people just crying, being so touched through music, and uh, what the atmosphere was like, you know, on stage or just in Pyongyang, especially when you had the chance to uh, really just feel and see the reaction of the audience. What was the whole experience like for you? As the other people mentioned, I think we were united in this music. And uh, what really broke my heart at the beginning when I just visited Pyongyang was that uh, they all knew that we were all connected and uh, we wanted to talk, but uh, North Koreans were not allowed to do so. They had to restrain themselves. And I had a chance to go and visit a school for children, and I taught some of the um, music concepts to these children, and I brought some musical instruments, and I don't know if they were delivered to the children, but when I looked at the conditions of the instruments, they were not in good condition. And what really broke my heart when I was talking to these children were, was that they didn't really know what the outside world would look like. So they were happy in there. But now with this internet, I heard that North Korean people do know what's happening outside of North Korea. But so I feel a little better, but that doesn't mean that things have changed inside North Korea. 
And you know that a lot of seniors would say that there's this emotion, this uh, compressed emotion and sorrow in uh, the people's hearts, in Korean people's hearts. And I went to the U.S. with my family when I was 10, but I think I felt this special emotion or Korean unique emotion called Han at that time. And at that time, uh, some would say that Arirang is a happy song and Arirang is rather a sad piece. So there are many interpretations of Arirang at that time. But when I was performing Arirang, I felt that we were the same people, but we were very different. So uh, my heart was rather sad. And at that time, it, I felt sad also because I had to leave. And we were there not to perform for the elite in North Korea, but for those who were not able to appreciate music, but we were there in front of the elite. That was quite unfortunate. So that was 2008, long time ago. But as I was listening to you, I felt like I was transported back there and I am actually filled with the same emotions as if I were there, and I wonder how moved I would be. So you were not able to deliver the instruments directly to the children? No, and I was not able to do so because there were security people watching me. There was this very handsome and good-looking young security guard, <laughs> and and there was another older security guard, and I was not allowed to uh, do this and that, and so it was not easy for me to go through them uh, and reach out directly to the children. The last question goes to Governor Choi Moon Soon. As we listen to the story of the performance in Pyongyang, it seems that art can do what politics cannot. In order to reopen the door for exchanges, what should be our future direction? Well, this is not politics, but it is the most refined version of politics. It's politics, but not politics. Chairman Kim Jong-il at that time talked about the politics of music how there was this revolutionary political event between North Korea and the U.S. And so if we use only politics, it's very difficult, but through art, through performance, through sports, we can move the hearts of the stakeholders. We had the opportunity to see students at the Pyongyang University of Music, and you wanted to invite them to New York. And so I hope that we can open the exchanges, and I hope that you can join us in these exchanges with the students from New York and Pyongyang. So this brings us to the end of the talk, and we will go to the last performance of the opening ceremony. Please return to your seats. And we would now like to invite Michelle Kim for the last performance. Thank you very much for joining us today. For sharing your stories with us. Thank you. 네, 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. A big round of applause, please. So here at this venue, we were able to appreciate a beautiful performance by the New York Philharmonic String Quartet, and we also had a chance to have a peace talk on this uh, Pyongyang performance in 2008. This was a rare and very valuable opportunity for us to be able to feel the power of art and culture and it was very special to hear directly from the members of the orchestra who visited Pyongyang in 2008. We now have one last very special stage by Michelle Kim, and the first piece is titled Sorrow and Grace, which is a mashup between Amazing Grace and Korean folk music arranged by Kim dok -kyu. It is a solo performance. Please welcome Michelle Kim with a big round of applause.
Next, we would like to invite a song that it represents peace, Imagine by John Lennon, and it is a rearranged version combined with Meet Again, which is a North Korean song. We will be inviting Michelle Kim, also a player of Hegum, which is a Korean instrument, and Ongyugum, which is a North Korean instrument. Let us invite this melody of peace.
Thank you very much. Another big round of applause, please. In 2008, we started with a performance in Pyongyang. We went on to 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. And now we are here at the 2022 Pyeongchang Peace Forum. It was indeed very moving and beautiful. I would like to take this opportunity to once again thank the New York Philharmonic String Quartet, Michelle Kim, Kang Eun Il, and Kim Ha Yun. We would like to invite them back to the stage. Thank you very much for joining us all the way from the U.S. to perform for us today. Thank you to the String Quartet of the New York Philharmonic, Ms. Michelle Kim, Ms. Kang Eun Il, and Ms. Kim Ha Hyun. We would like to deliver some flowers to show our appreciation. Thank you very much for the beautiful performance. Another big round of applause, please. We would now like to take a commemorative photo. Ah, Ichoguru, can we move one step to the right or two steps to the right, please? Ichoguru, ne Ichoguru, ne Ichoguru. Ne Desimida, thank you very much. We would like to take a moment for a group photo. This will end the commemorative photo session. Another big round of applause, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that moving and beautiful performance. Please return to your seats. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for the opening ceremony of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2022. Under the theme of Peace Here and Now, we will continue our three days of dialogue. We have prepared a DMZ peace zone within the metaverse. This will enable you to have meetings within the DMZ peace zone. We look forward to your interest and support. This brings us to the end of the opening ceremony. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Following the opening ceremony, let's begin the keynote session. I'd like to thank all of the participants from home and abroad for joining us despite your very busy schedules. I would like to express my gratitude to the online audience as well. Now, let us begin the keynote session titled Peaceful Economic Development on the Korean Peninsula with uh, Chairman Jim Rogers, Chairman of Rogers Holdings, as the keynote speaker. Mr. Jim Rogers will be delivering his keynote speech. Please welcome uh, Chairman Rogers with a big round of applause. Thank you. Well, I am delighted to be here. Uh, I am certainly delighted that the governor invited me back again, and I always have a lot of fun out here. But the most important thing is, I hope this is the last time we ever have this conference. It says here, peace here and now. Well, I hope so. I hope we open the 38th parallel soon. I hope that this whole madness of a divided Korea ends and we can go on to bigger and better things and more and more prosperity. Uh, yes, before we start, I want to just start by saying a few years ago, my then fiance, now my wife, Paige Parker, and I spent three years driving around the world, 245,000 kilometers, and went through 116 countries. And as you can see, we got into the Guinness Book of World Records because I'm the first fund manager to drive around the world. So in my case, it was fairly easy to get into the, to the Guinness Book of Records. We started in Iceland, we drove through Europe, Turkey, China, Korea, Japan, Siberia, Mongolia, around Europe, 32 countries in Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, down to the bottom of South America, up to Alaska, and down to the U.S. and back to New York. The reason I show you this is because I want to tell you the Korean Peninsula can be and should be the most exciting place in the world once we open the 38th parallel. I've seen many, many countries in the world. I've invested in many countries in the world. And once you get this 38th parallel open, this part of the world for at least 10, 20, 25 years could be and should be the single most exciting place in the world. I want to show you, I'll show you two minutes. We started in Iceland on our trip, off to the Great Wall. We did get married on the trip. Here we are cutting our cake. This is our honeymoon. One of many camels we visited. We went through several war zones. These guys were not very friendly at first. But if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a familiar face. One of many markets we visited. One of many bad roads. A sad time, we went to an AIDS orphanage down in South Africa. We went to see King Tut. 
We always stopped at schools when we could. This is in India. They always wanted to have their pictures made. Myanmar, one of many roadside stands where we ate and drank. Iguazu Falls in South America. This is a bane of my existence. This is bureaucracy, red tape, regulations. This, on the other hand, is the black market. This is a much higher class of people. And when we got back to the US, we kept going. We headed up to Alaska in the dead of winter. And when we got back to the New York, our first stop was the World Trade Center. That had blown up while we were gone. But I want to emphasize again, I showed you two minutes of going around the world. You know, I've spent five years driving around the world, going around twice. This could be the single most exciting place. When we got home, we rested for a while. One result of resting for a while is, as you can see, we now have a baby girl. I also want to tell you, apropos of Korea, I had never wanted children. I thought children were a terrible waste of time, money, energy. I was never, ever going to have a child. I felt sorry for my friends who had children. I want you to know I was wrong. I was completely wrong about children, and this little girl has been terrific. So please, if you're old enough, take a day off. Well, maybe go home for lunch. Have a lunch hour, you know. Go home, you will have a lot of fun. Do it for yourself, do it for Korea, do it for the world. I took my own advice. I went home for lunch one day, and now I have another one. So you see, I'm giving you advice, but it's advice I'm acting on myself. And by the way, I know that in Korea you think boys are good, and they are, I like boys, but girls are much, much better. So when you go home for lunch, be sure you have girls. And Korea needs girls. So please, have some children, but be sure they're girls, because Korea needs children, and Korea needs girls. Um, you all know where we are very well. It's a very strategic location. It can be in the world. You know, it used to be a railroad that went up the East Coast and up the West Coast. There will be again, and Korea can become a transportation hub for Eurasia. I mean, there's no reason that this place cannot be a very exciting center of world transportation and commerce again. Once you have the railroads, once you open the 38th parallel, we can join in, we can hook in with the transportation network in China, the One Belt, One Road. The Chinese are opening up a lot, and there's the Trans-Siberian Railroad. So Korea, Hanbando, can become an extremely exciting transportation cup when we open the 38th parallel. Someday, I want to get in my car in Busan and drive to London. We can all drive from here to London someday. All we have to do is open the 38th parallel, and we'll be off. It's a big world out there. You're, you're in the right place. You're right here in, in Asia with three billion people, three billion people that don't have huge debt like we do in the West, in the US, and in, in Europe. So this can be and will be the most exciting part of the world once again. As you, as you all know, I'm not the only person who knows that Korea has been doing a good job. As you can see, your stock market has gone up a lot in the past several years. But I want you to know, once we open the 38th parallel, this is going to be an extremely exciting place to invest. South Korea has huge amounts of capital and management ability. North Korea has a lot of disciplined, educated, cheap labor. North Korea has lots of natural resources. We're talking about a new country of 80 million people on the Chinese border. Every, most people are in favor of this. Russia, China, Japan is against it. Japan does not want the 
38th parallel to open because Japan knows it cannot compete with an open Korea. But they cannot stop it. They cannot stop you because once you open the 38th parallel and you put together the advantages of the North, the advantages of the South, this is going to be a strong, strong powerhouse. You also have the advantage that your currency has been stable. As you know, many, quote, developing markets in the world do not have stable currencies. South Korea, for whatever reason, and I mainly attribute it to good management, good management in Seoul, you have a stable currency. Your currency will be very strong once you open the 38th parallel. There are going to be enormous, enormous advantages here. So when I tell you that Hanban Do is going to be the most exciting part of the world for investing, for living, for everything else, I'm quite serious. Uh, as you all know, as you all know, uh, your debt has been going up a lot in the past few years. I live in the United States. I mean, I'm a U.S. citizen. I don't live there, but I'm a U.S. citizen. Uh, we have the largest debt in the history of the world. America is the single largest debtor in world history. So I'm not saying debt is good. Not at all saying debt is good. But Korea, some of your prosperity in the past uh, 10, 20, 30 years has been based on debt. Once you open the 38th parallel, the debt diminishes as a proportion of the population. North Korea doesn't have any debt. <laughs> Nobody will lend money to the Kims, so you don't have to worry about adding a lot of new debt to your, to your economy and to your society. You, the debt per person will clearly go down and go down substantially when you open the new frontier in North Korea. Throughout history, when people open a new frontier, it has always led to new prosperity and new th ways to do business and th new things to do. I know that there are many companies now who have task forces trying to figure out, okay, what do we do? How will we invest? How will we make money? How will we do business once the 38th parallel is open? I'm not the only person who knows this is coming. Uh, many major South Korean companies, and South Korea is going to be the biggest beneficiary of this new front there. You have the language, you have the same grandparents, great-grandparents, you have the same history. So most Korean companies are going to do very well. The debt burden that Korea, South Korea now has will be diminished. It's going to benefit you in many, many ways. Now, as you all know, South Korea spends huge amounts of money on defense every year. North Korea spends huge amounts of money on defense every year. Can you imagine how much money you're going to have once you don't have to spend a lot of money on guns and tanks and bullets? South Korea is spending gigantic amounts of money. North Korea is too. You don't have to worry about getting killed in a war anymore. Once you have that 38th parallel open, and I'm not using the word unification. I, unification is not that significant to me. Just open the border. Korea has been here for a few thousand years. <laughs> you've had some good times. You've had some bad times. Once you open the 38th parallel, the, the Koreans, the 80 million Koreans who are here and who've been here for centuries, you'll figure out what to do. You don't need me to tell you what to do. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do. You open the 38th parallel, you stop spending all of this money, huge amounts of money that both of you, you see what a huge percentage of their gross national product is spent on defense? Maybe some people think that's good. I don't. I think we could build schools, highways, factories. We could have a big, big, big party if we open the 38th parallel and stop spending so much money on guns and tanks and bullets. Your population has been rising, but as you know, the birth rate is down a lot now. There's certain anxiety, tension, call it what you will, 
in South Korea, and there has been for the various reasons, partly because everybody's worried about getting killed someday. You don't have to worry about getting killed the rest of your life. Everybody has worried about getting killed all of their lives. We can stop that. We can spend the money on a big, big, big party, and we can have, as it says here, peace here and now. This can be done, and it can make the Korean Peninsula the single most exciting country in the world for a while. You know, Korea has never been on the world tourism map, the international tourism map, for many reasons. You know the reasons, war, Japan, all sorts of reasons. Once the 38th parallel is open, many people are going to say, why don't we go to Korea? Let's see what it is, what it was. They haven't been here. They go to Bali, they go to China, they go to Japan even, they go other places when they think about traveling or thinking about Asia. But once there's peace and you don't have to worry about getting killed, many adventurous tourist, tourists will come here. They will see great man-made sites. They will see natural sites, food. Many people like Korean food. I don't particularly like most Korean food, but many people love Korean food. So when the first ones come here and they see what a great, exciting place this is, culturally, nature, the whole works, you're going to have a huge tourism boom. Many things are going to boom in this part of the world, including you will start having more babies again. One other advantage that we would have if we open the 38th parallel, as many of you know, you don't have enough, you don't have enough babies in South Korea, and you certainly don't have enough girl babies. I told you before, babies are good. I told you before, girl babies are good. They've got girls in North Korea. They've got wives in North Korea. You don't have to go to the Philippines. You don't have to go to Vietnam or Los Angeles to search for wives. There'll be plenty of females, so opening the 38th parallel will do enormous, have enormous benefits for Hanbando. Your social pressures from girls, the social pressure from war, the financial pressure, the economic war, from spending a lot of money on guns and tanks. There are going to be gigantic and huge changes in Hanbando. It is going to be the most exciting place in the world for a decade or two or three. Uh, as I said, China's for it, Russia's for it, Japan is against it, but they cannot stop you. Japan knows they cannot compete with an open Hanbando, uh, an open Korean peninsula. So get to work and do it. The main problem, of course, is the American army. The American army doesn't want to leave, but somewhere along the line, the Koreans are going to say, this is our country. We don't need an army of occupation again. We can open our borders. You can make peace, make a deal with the North Koreans, make a deal with the South Koreans, make a deal with China, make a deal with Russia. What a very, very exciting place. I'm going to, I love Korea already. Korea is now my favorite country in the world for many reasons. It is going to be such a wonderful, exciting place. All you have to do is, you see what it says? Peace, here and now. That's all you got to do. Somebody just needs to go and make a deal with Mr. Kim. It's going to change a lot of things. You get rid of the military. The money you spend on guns and tanks is going to be, go for other things. I will tell you what, some of you know the Western pop group, the Rolling Stones. I will bring the Rolling Stones. You bring Blackpink. Ah, we have the head of the National Assembly here. You bring Blackpink. The North Koreans can bring whoever they want. We will have a big party. We will leave the 38th parallel open. We will leave the DMZ open and Han Bando will be a very, very exciting and prosperous place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for, your, for imparting your knowledge and insight. It was very 
thought-provoking as well. Thank you very much for your dialogue on peaceful economic development on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much once again, Chairman Jim Rogers, for your presentation. This brings us to the end of the keynote session of the PyeongChang Peace Forum 2022. Thank you very much for joining us.